Hello viewers and welcome to another episode of The Model Guy. In this special edition episode, I'm going to be hooking up with sunwordhobbies.ca to build Tamiya's KV-1 tank in 1 35th scale. Sunwordhobbies.ca has Canada's largest selection of hobby paints, tools, and plastic kits, and they ship to most addresses in USA and Canada. And holy jumping, they're selling Kotari spits for 100 bucks. That's basically free. The year is 1938, and watching the Spanish Civil War, the Soviet Union realizes that tank tactics might be a little bit different from what they anticipated, and decided they needed to develop a larger breakthrough tank. While Soviet technology might not have been as advanced as the Germans in 1938, the Soviets did know the areas that they could potentially be fighting in, and knew that they needed a vehicle with wide tracks and diesel engines to be able to perform in the snow and cold conditions of Mother Russia. They also knew that they'd have to slap a lot of armor on it as well. Speaking of simple designs, do you like that tank stand that I'm bolting to the model? That was something I designed after I didn't want to spend big money on an octopus and just needed something simple that would hold a model in place while I built and painted it. If you'd like one for yourself, contact me through either Facebook or Instagram and I'll be able to hook you up. Even though the KV-1 looked like a winner on paper, the Soviets decided to send it into combat in the Finnish Winter War alongside two other potential heavy tank designs to see which one would come out on top. With its thick armor and 76mm gun, the KV-1 did a lot of damage in the Finnish war. And the only thing that really came out of it as a negative was that the Soviets needed a bigger gun when they were facing blockhouses and decided to design the KV-2, which had the 152mm gun. You may also know this as Stalin's fridge. When doing the research on the KV-1, I found that Tamiya's texture on the front plates were a little lacking and decided to create a rolled steel texture using putty. Now all I did was thin this down with some Tamiya cement and then stipple it in place. And after a little while, sanded it with some 3000 grit sanding paper. If I wanted this to look like a more of a cast texture, I wouldn't have sanded down as much and done a few more layers. The textures Tamiya did for the welds and the torch marks on the steel are actually really good. And the only reason I'm redoing them here is because I was blowing out that rolled steel effect and decided to match it. This is gonna give the tank an overall heavier look. If you've ever used a torch to cut steel, you know that afterwards it's not a jagged sharp edge, but if you're doing it properly, it has a sort of smooth transition to it. So to get that same effect, I used some glue just to melt down the edges, and that got the torch marks exactly where I wanted them. And now because I was doing all that, why not take it one step further and redo the welds on the hull as well. Using the combination of a hobby knife and a small chisel, I removed the welds and cleaned up the area before rolling up some epoxy putty. Another reason I decided to redo the welds was when I looked at the add-on armor on the tank, I noticed that they just glued on and there's nothing actually holding them in place. So in reality, they would have been welded as well. With the add-on armor drying in place, it was time to prep the putty for welding. If you're using green stuff putty, one big piece of advice I can give you is to cut out the section where the blue and yellow join. That is hardened and it's gonna leave you with little tiny specks in the putty that you're unable to sculpt. I will give a big shout out and thank you to TJ Holler who gave me a heads up on that and basically it's something I can now avoid. It was something that was a real challenge when I was trying to roll the tarp later on down the road. Now that I had the epoxy rolled out as noodles, it was ready to be applied. And I did this using a wet toothpick and jammed it where the steel plates would meet on the tank. Once it was in place, I would then use my homemade sculpting tool to start putting the actual welds in. And this looks like something that would be a lot of work, but for some odd reason, I found it really relaxing. Kind of like those ASMR videos on YouTube. With all the welding done, then the bolt-on pieces were glued in place. One thing I've noticed with Tamiya tank kits is some details are reproduced in a really simple manner. Take these anchors on the tank deck for example. They're just a solid piece, but with a drill bit and a few minutes, I'm able to put a hole in there and make it look that much better. Tamiya did a really good job here of replicating the cast look on the turret, and I left well enough alone. One thing I did though was replace the welds on the turret to match the welds I had replaced on the tank's body. Because I was doing this build as a sponsored video, I didn't want to waste time waiting for metal barrels or metal tracks and replacement parts for the kit, 
I wanted to build it straight out of the box. So the only thing I really had to do to improve the barrel was to clean up the mold line on it. And if you've ever done aircraft canopies, this is a walk in the park. It's just a matter of going through all the different sanding grits until you get up to about 4,000. Although the KV-1 tank had performed well in the Finnish Winter War, it had some major drawbacks that the Germans exploited in 1941. And in a twist of irony, even though the Germans learned that this heavy tank wasn't doing well in combat, they decided to build a heavy tank of their own. But that'll be a different story for a different day. The KV-1's transmission was not up to the task of carrying this heavy tank around, so as soon as crews started adding more armor to the tank, they actually handicapped its maneuverability and speed. And although the tank could not be penetrated by Panzer III and IV guns, what the Germans quickly learned to do was to flank these tanks and get in behind them with explosives and disable the tank. How bad was the transmission in the KV-1? The rumors had it that crews would often have to use hammers to get the tank into gear. There were some heroic stands of KV-1 crews standing up to the German advance and stalling them, but at the end of the day, those tanks were still disabled and couldn't stop the German onslaught. Knowing that the KV-1 was turning out to be more of a liability in the face of the German attack, senior commanders were finally able to convince their higher-ups that production needed to focus on the T-34 and switch from the KV-1. They were able to sell this idea when they pointed out that the T-34 had the same gun but was more maneuverable and less expensive to produce. However, that did not signal the end of the KV-1's life. And in fact, it was used as a base to produce more heavy tanks for the Soviet arsenal. The KV-1 chassis still served as the base for the Su-152 and the KV-85. The KV-85 featured an 85mm gun and continued in service until the IS-2 tank was ready. And the ISU-52, that continued in service right up until the end of the war. To give this model a more beat up look, I used a Dremel and a bit to thin out the fenders before putting some dents and dings in them. I didn't want to go to the extreme of tearing off entire fenders. Another simple modification I made to the tank to make it more interesting was to remove the turnbuckle off one of the sides to make it look less symmetrical. After I cut that off, I simply used a drill bit to clear out the bracket where that turnbuckle sits. To me, it does give you some strings to use for your tow cables, but I found it easier just to use some copper wire. This stays nice and stiff, and you're able to bend it like a steel cable would in real life. One nice thing about Tamiya is they give you the measurement right in the instructions so you're able to cut your cable to the proper length. I then use super glue to set that cable in place. You have to remember that these cables have some weight to them in real life, so you don't want them floating in the air or looking out of place. Here's a little bit of a switch up. When it came time to prime this tank, I decided to use pink for the primer. My idea here was it was gonna give a warmer hue to the greens going on top. I didn't wanna have a boring dark green or that yellowish green that some Soviet models have. I wanted it to be believable, but I wanted it to be interesting as well. One problem I found with AK Real Color paints is a lot of the time their pots don't match. So I decided to take one of my 4BO pots and drop a few drops of NATO black in there to darken it up. And I was gonna put this into the shaded areas on the tank. One added benefit of a bright pink primer is it lets you see if you've missed anywhere really quick. This dark green was also gonna serve as the base for some of the weathering. Now, as you can see here, these are both 4BO paints from AK Real Colors, but they're two totally different shades. One I'll call the sad 4BO on the left, and then the happy 4BO on the right. It's a little bit brighter. Now that I had one pot of base 4BO green, I guess you could call it, I added some buff into the sad 4BO to lighten it up a little bit. And the idea here is this is going to be the underlying layer of paint. So when I start scuffing off the next layer, it's going to give it a very distressed look. Once I had the tank completely covered in sad 4BO green, I sealed it with some semi-clear, and after it dried, applied two thin layers of chipping fluid. One trick I've found to using the AK chipping fluid is to shoot it at the model from a little bit of a distance so it dries before it hits the tank. If you soak the model with chipping fluid or it's beating up, you won't get the nice chips that you want, and instead it'll almost roll off in sheets and you have to do the whole process over again. What I'm aiming for here is nice, thin, 
even coverage. And I'm gonna do two layers of this. And I'm gonna allow about 10 minutes between each layer to dry. After everything is dried, I then shoot the entire tank again with a nice even layer of the sad 4BO right out of the pot. To reactivate the chipping fluid under the paint, I'm gonna apply just enough water to dampen it. I don't want to soak the paint or else everything will lift off. Then I'm gonna use a stiff brush and lightly rub the paint until it starts to chip. The harder you chip, the more that's gonna come off. And I wanted to do this in a slow, controlled manner. I've found by using different shaped brushes and even a toothbrush that will change the different chips I get from the paint. This might look drastic right now, but you have to remember I'm not doing chips in a regular way like wear and tear. I'm trying to set a base for distressed paint to give it some more depth. For the decals, I'm going to use some Mark Fit Super Strong from Tamiya and put the decal directly on the paint. Notice I'm only using a thin amount of decal solution. If I put too much, especially on an acrylic paint, it'll actually lift the paint and damage it. Once I have the decal in place, I'm going to do another layer or two on top and let that settle in. Happy with the distressing and now that the decals are on, I seal everything under two coats of semi-gloss clear. This is going to protect the paint from any following stages. So by using acrylic paint for chips, if I'm not happy, I can just wet the acrylic paint and wipe it away without worrying about damaging the paint underneath. After mixing the paints, I'm going to use a sponge, dip it in the paint, and offload as much as possible on paper towel. Then I'm going to use the sponge to apply chips directly to the model. Although the sponge gives you a nice random pattern for your chipping, you will notice quickly that it still leaves a pattern that's predictable. So you have to be very careful and spread it out and turn the sponge and try to get as much as possible out of it and try to stay away from that repetition. Once I'm done with all the sponge chipping, I then can come in with a 3 yacht brush and tie some of them together and add some chips in a targeted area, like right along the lip of this hatch here, somewhere that the sponge isn't going to reach properly. Using that same brush and mixture, I can also create scratches in the paint as well. If you don't have a steady hand to draw these scratches, you can actually use tape as a sort of bumper to guide your brush to do scratches as well. The next step of this journey is to get the steel road wheels painted and polished up. To do this, I used AK 3rd Gen Natural Steel Paint. After the paints had some time to dry, I then use a graphite stick to add some pigment onto this paint, and then I'll use a silicone brush to polish that up. And I'll actually do two or three rounds to get a nicely polished finish. If you ever look at modern construction equipment that has steel wheels and steel tracks, you'll notice that these get polished up pretty quick and stay pretty clean. And if you don't have access to equipment like that, Take a look at the next time a train passes you at a rail crossing. Look at the rail tracks and look at the wheels on the train. They have an almost chrome finish. With the paint chips dry, it's now time to move into oils. And the idea here is I'm going to use the oils to push back that distressed look on the paint. On any vertical surface, what I'll do is add the oils at the top and then use a flat brush or even a jagged brush to streak it downwards. And I'll do this until the oil paints are almost disappeared. I then use a hairdryer to dry it and repeat the process several times. Because I'm doing this in thin layers, it takes a little while to build up, but it also gives me a lot of control over how much of that distressing still shows through. For the deck of the tank and anywhere that's a flat horizontal surface, I'm going to put a little bit of enamel thinner down and that'll help me move the oil paints around. The idea here is I'm going for a dusty midsummer look on the tank, so I want a lot of light oil tones here. While applying the dust colored oil, I'm trying to keep it in areas that make sense and I don't want to just do a hodgepodge all over the tank. For example, around the air filters and around the engine deck where you're going to get a lot of the crew dragging dirt and filth on top of it, it makes sense to have dirt there but not on the round down of the back of the tank because no one's really going to be standing on that. For blending the oils on the flat surfaces, I'm using a Deerfoot Stippler brush. You'll also notice in this shot that that dust doesn't really show up too much yet with the oils, and it'll actually take a few layers before it does. 
It's easier to see what's going on with the black paint because it contrasts so much with the green underneath. You can see how I'm using this brush to slowly blend it in and then add some more layers, blend it in again. Different shaped brushes are going to give you different effects, so don't be afraid to try different things. Oil paints are one of the most powerful mediums we have in model making to do weathering and different effects on models. By thinning them to different consistencies, you can create filters, washes, stains, and leaks. I find it much easier to do that than buy some of the pre-made enamel washes and filters. Anytime you're using the hair dryer to dry your oils and speed the process up, just be careful how close you are to the plastic. Moving on to the next step in the weathering, I'm trying to create that effect you'll see on your truck when you drive down dusty roads in the summer, especially somewhere like Alberta where you don't get a lot of rain, there's not a lot of moisture in the ground, and the dust just settles on everything. To do this on the tank, I'm going to apply some chipping fluid on it again, and then come in with a light dust mix of buff and earth and German grey, and gently cloud that into areas where dust will collect. And once I've taken the time to do that and I'm happy with it, I'm then going to start chipping the dust out of areas where the crew or soldiers around would be knocking it off. I'm also trying to keep this effect in the rear of the tank where all that cloud of dust would be kicked up by the tracks. This time I'm using a dampened brush to knock the paint off because for some reason it was really easy to remove this time. You'll also notice I'm only removing it from areas where the crew's hands would be grabbing, especially lifting up the engine deck. To get a nice deep dark green color for the pin wash, I mixed Starship Filth and Field Green and then thinned it with enamel thinner. You'll know if you've used too much thinner because the wash will try to go everywhere and you'll know you haven't used enough because it just applies as an oil. Ideally you want it to run freely through all the details on the kit. If your mixture is bang on, it'll do the work for you. Unfortunately I forgot to paint this tarp before doing all the dust work. So after painting it by hand with some Vallejo acrylics, I then had to come in and add some dust on top of it just so it matched the rest of the tank. This was a good lesson to learn because the M10 I'm currently building as well has a lot of stowage on it and a lot of tarps that are going to need to be painted. Moving along into the weathering process, I used AK's dry ground texture to build up basically dried up ground and dust around the drive axles of the tank. And the idea here is I'm not doing a heavy muddy tank, but just some caked up dust. One of the big drawbacks of the AK textures is they dry really quick and you have to blend them with water within 30 seconds or else you're not going to be able to do it. One trick that I learned that worked really well was to put some of this paste in a dish, and add a little bit of water, and that made it easier to blend. But the problem was it would dry out just as fast and it'd be a little bit of a pain to clean out. With the ground textures in place, I then blended it using an airbrush and the same paint mix I used on the rest of the tank. One thing I noticed about the KV series of tanks is there's a pretty big gap between the top and bottom run of tracks, so any work you do in here is going to be visible in the end. So it was worth it to take my time and do it in a few layers. To add a little bit more depth to the weathering, I used some dark mud oil paint and just slowly blended it in in the rear of the tank where the ground textures were a little bit thicker. And because that was an oil paint, I just used some enamel thinner to blend it in with the dust. For the road wheels and the tracks of the KV-1, I used the same ground texture, but this time thinned it down a little bit with the water. Unfortunately, I also lied to you guys in this video. Although I had planned for this to be a completely out-of-box build with no add-ons, I actually had a set of KV-2 tracks that I put on a trumpeter kit a few years ago. Now having young kids, you can pretty much imagine what happened, but knowing those tracks were hard to come by, I pulled them off and saved them for a rainy day. And it turns out, they fit on the Tamiya KV-1 rather well, and I only had to pull three links out to get the proper sag. One of the benefits of metal tracks is you can wait to the very end before you install them on the tank. I've done link in length before, but I found it a little bit of a challenge trying to assemble them and then pull them off the tank for painting and then reinstalling them onto the tank. I know not everyone has a spare set of metal tracks laying around, and having built the Panzer IV last year, Tamiya's link to length tracks weren't too bad. But they weren't also the size of KV-1 tracks. 
The last thing to paint on the tank now was the steel tow cable, and I used some German gray and then old rust from Vallejo, and then the exhaust stacks. For the exhaust stacks, I started out with AK Third Gen's ivory paint, and I blended it in and then used some sponge chipping to break it up. And the idea here is that's going to be the most worn areas of the exhaust. After I did that, I repeated the process with some Vallejo Old Rust. To tie everything together, I then used some AK Light Rust and slowly built up the layers. Once I was happy with that, I then came in with a darker AK Streaking Rust just to give it some depth. And that is going to bring this episode to a close. Once again, make sure you go over and check out the sponsor for this video, Sunward Hobbies, and check out their selection of hobby paints, tools, and plastic kits they have online. And remember, they ship to most places in USA and Canada. And once again, Daniela and Angelo, thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciated it. And as always, thank you to the viewers for keeping this channel growing. If you like the video, don't forget to hit subscribe, drop a like, and drop a comment below. If you didn't like it, leave that criticism as well. I'm always looking to grow as a modeler. You can also follow me over on Instagram and Facebook at Robbie the Model Guy. That's it for now, and I will see you all next time.